All right, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome back to the Aquarium of the Pacific's Online Academy. My name is Dana. I'm a member of the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific coming to you live from Long Beach, California today. Now, when I say live, I do mean at Pacific Standard Time, 1 p.m. on Tuesday, June 30th. So if you're watching us right now during that live stream, we're going to bring up a phone number for you here to participate throughout our programming. Today, we're going to be doing move-in and groove. Now, it's going to be a little bit different than the moving and grooving you have been uh, possibly joining us for. We're going to take a little bit of a slower approach, all right? But that programming phone number is going to be right here. It's 562 562- 286-1838. And like I said, you're welcome to join in and participate throughout this program, hopefully by moving and grooving, but also if you have any questions or you want to share observations that you're making throughout our program. Now, keep in mind that standard data rates do apply with your, t- uh, with your cell phone carrier. And if you're one of our younger viewers, do make sure that you have an adult's permission today before you text in, okay? All right, my friends, now we're going to get going today. And like I said, it's going to be a little bit different. So what we're going to focus on throughout our moving and grooving program is different animals and different adaptations that they have. Now, some of them might be movement adaptations that we're talking about, how this animal moves. Some of them might also just be how they use certain appendages. Some of them also might just be how do they defend themselves and what can, what kind of movement can we do to represent that. Okay, so if that sounds like fun, we're going to be really focusing on stretching out and kind of opening our body up. We're going to be taking a lot of deep breaths. It's kind of like a yoga moving and grooving. All right, so get ready. Join us. I'm excited to have you here today. And we're going to have Sarah controlling what's going on right back here. Now, she's going to put animals up, we're going to chat about those adaptations, and then we're going to move together. And then, of course, I have Cynthia out um, at our question table. And if you text questions in to that phone number right here, uh, we will answer those and she'll pass them into the studio here so that we can maybe give you a shout out. Um, And then I did mention the live text number. If you are watching after 1 to 1.30 Pacific Standard Time on Tuesday, June 30th, Uh, We do ask that you actually email us your questions instead, and that's going to be this email address right down there. It is live at lbaop.org. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and start moving and grooving, okay? So we're going to put up our very first one, and we're going to take it nice and easy, and I love this one because it just makes me feel peaceful when I'm watching it right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to start off, like I said, we're going to be opening our body up a lot. We're going to really be trying to kind of deepen our breath and really stretch out. And so what I want you all to do is I want you to put your hands up, take a deep breath, and we're going to sway like our kelp here, okay? Now, kelp Just like you see on the screen behind me, this is an algae, and it grows in our oceans right here in Southern California. And you can see that swaying movement that it's doing. That's because of the surge in the ocean. And that's like the current kind of moving back and forth as waves come in towards land. And so, again, if you put your hands up, make sure you really drop your shoulders back, and you're going to sway back and forth just like that kelp. You want to try to feel it squeezing right back in here, making sure those shoulders are back. You're not lifting your shoulders to your chin, right? Or your ears. Drop your shoulders, squeeze them back. Ah, just like that. Mm, It's like a good stretch, right? Oh, yeah. Right there. All right, everyone. Now, like I said, it is a local species right here. So this is found off of our coastline. And what's really amazing about our giant kelp is it's actually only found in about five places around the world. So we're very fortunate to have this super peaceful organism right here. Now we're going to move on to our next one now that we kind of got the shakes out. All right. Oh, you may move around in different directions. Let's see what other animal. Oh my, check that out. So this animal right here is one of our octopus, right? So an octopus, what do we know about octopus? What kind of adaptations do they have? Hmm. Now an adaptation is something that an animal has or is born with that helps it survive. So usually that's something to do with defense, finding a mate, or catching food. Now, oftentimes when we talk about octopus, we kind of reference their name octo, right? Which means eight. Now our octopus friends, like we see right here, this is a two spot octopus. Our octopus buddies have eight 
arms. Now you might be confused because I said arms and not tentacles, but we do in fact refer to their appendages as arms. Now I said that it's usually an adaptation to help them find a food, find a mate, or, or uh, become to keep from becoming food, right? And so we're going to focus on the catching food aspect. Now those arms that the octopus has, they're used to reach out and grab different prey items. Okay, so what we're going to do for our moving and grooving today, we're going to take that deep breath and we're going to reach for a clam and capture it and bring it back in. And then we're going to reach for a crab. We're going to capture it and bring it back in. And then we're going to reach for your face. Oh, no, that's not right. I'm sorry. We're going to reach for another clam and bring it back in. Oh, we're going to reach over here. And we actually have a video of an octopus using those arms to stretch across and reach. Let's take a look at it. So you can see each arm has those suction cups on them. which is pretty incredible. So this is a giant Pacific octopus and giant Pacific octopus have 250 suction cups on each arm. Now, when we grabbed that clam and pulled it in close, the octopus takes it right here. This is right in between all eight of those arms and they have a mouth. It's actually a beak-like structure, sort of like a parrot. And it's hard and it's able to crush hard shells like clam shells or even like a, like a crab exoskeleton. So one more time, my friends, just like our octopus friends with their eight arms, just like this one, kind of looks like we're doing it right here, right? We're going to reach out and grab a clam. We're going to reach out and we're going to grab a crab. What's your favorite food? What would you be reaching for? Hmm. Ooh, Sarah would reach for mac and cheese. We're going to reach out and blah, 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 mac and cheese. I might reach for a cookie. I might reach for, let's see. Ooh, this weekend I had a chocolate fudge brownie cheesecake slice. I think I'm going to reach for that. Ugh. All right, now we did have a question come into the studio and it's what's my favorite octopus? That's a great question. So I actually love octopus. Uh, my favorite question or my favorite octopus is probably the two spot, but of course also a giant Pacific because giant Pacific are um, really big. They're the largest of our octopus species, but two spot are local species and I've worked with them quite a bit. I used to work out in a tide pool habitat and we would be looking for them. And so learning how to find them in the natural habitat because they're clearly very good at camouflaging. It's actually kind of hard to see this one, right? But here's arms right around here. That's its eyeball right up here. And then this is actually its mantle. So the mantle is kind of their main body cavity. Um, but they're really hard to find. And so I just really enjoyed the challenge of working with two spot. Plus this spot right here, it's a false eye spot. And what it does is it can actually get really vibrant colors. It can get like a, a kind of almost like a, a fluorescent blue. It's really beautiful. Um, so thank you for the question. My favorite is a two spot octopus. All right, my friends. So we started off like kelp and then we moved on to our octopus. Right? Let's go ahead and see what other animals we can uh, stretch and breathe like today. Oh, I love this. This is a great photo of a sea lion. This is a California sea lion today. And what I really want to highlight in this animal is the adaptation of these long pectoral flippers. Okay? So they're going to be the arm like structures that help this animal move through a kelp forest or an offshore habitat right here in California. And what I want you to point out, uh, what I want to point out, ooh, perfect, is just how long these four flippers are. So you can actually watch them as they swim around. You can get an idea of what they might use those flippers for. So remember, one adaptation can be, um, an adaptation is anything that helps the animal survive. Do animals have to move around to survive? Yeah, a lot of animals have to move to catch food, to find a mate. They might have to avoid predators, right? So they can swim fast. So again, you can really see how those long pectoral flippers aid in the movement of this animal. Now, a sea lion is something known as a pinniped. It's a group of animals that are all uh, related and share common characteristics. And let's show you another pinniped before we really work on our stretching for this animal. And that's going to be this one right here. 
is Kaya. She's one of our baby Calif I'm sorry, uh, harbor seals. And what do you notice about Kaya, especially about Kaya's four flippers or pectoral flippers compared to those really long California sea lion flippers? What do you see here? Yeah, I see that too. They're a lot shorter, right? They're kind of stubby little flippers and they have long nails at the end. You can actually see them right in here. Okay, if you look real close, there's nails. Um, sea lions have nails too, but I think it stands out on seals a little bit more. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of compare seals and sea lions. And it's going to be a way for us to remember, well, also a way for us to move and kind of stretch out our upper body again. So what we're going to do is we are going to stick our arms out straight like a California sea lion. Deep breath and really reach for it. Oh, and then we're going to be a seal. and We're going to tuck up nice and tiny here, okay? So let's do it again. Now, when you tuck up, again, I want you to squeeze back here a little bit more and bring those shoulder blades all the way back so that your flippers are right here tucked in towards your armpits. And then we're going to be a California sea lion again. Do we have that photo? Let's see. California sea lions, do they look like this? No, silly. California sea lions look like this. So we're going to stretch them out and we're going to remind ourselves that that's a sea lion. Make sure you're not squishing up towards your ears. You want to put those shoulders down and back in towards like a seal. All right, everyone. And one more time. Big stretch. Ooh, reach them out like a sea lion and back in like a seal. So now we can kind of remember our California sea lions versus our harbor seals. That's a really good difference for you to recognize if you're out in the natural habitat and you see an animal. Let's chat real quick about the other differences we see between these two animals. Let's take a look at Kaya here. So Kaya also, if you take a look at the side of her head, this little area right here, that dark spot, while she does have spots on the body, this dark, dark spot in particular is an ear hole. Okay, now that's kind of weird to us because we have these big ear flaps, but I want you to take your fingers and just casually remove your ear flap for a moment. Oh, oh my gosh, where'd my ear go? Right, just like that. And then there's still a hole, right? So that's how our harbor seals here is they don't have those ear flaps. Instead, they just have a little ear hole in their head. But if we go back to that California sea lion photo or any other photo, perfect. You can actually see, this is Parker and one of our other boys here at the aquarium. You can see this little ear flap just like you and I, right? So our sea lions have those um, external ear flaps, okay? So, so far we've got the difference in the arms um, or their pectoral flippers. We've got the ears. What else did you notice? Are they both the same color? Hmm. These two right here are more of a chocolate brown, right? So they're a solid color. I like to think of them as ice cream. And chocolate ice cream is more or less fairly uniform in coloration, right? But if we were to look back at Kaya or any other harbor seal photo, you'll see that they have a little bit more speckled coloration on their body. And my favorite speckled ice cream, actually, I really like bubble gum, but it's usually like blue ice cream with colored polka dots. So that doesn't really count. So let's just say cookies and cream, right? <laughs> Which apparently is Sarah's favorite ice cream flavor. So um, cookies and cream has that kind of more mottled speckled coloration as opposed to the uniform chocolate ice cream that you um, might find in those California sea lions. So the, the ears, the flippers, and of course the coloration are three really big differences between our seals and our sea lions. So one more time, we've kind of done the swaying kelp, right? We've reached out and caught prey like an octopus. We've also stretched out like a California sea lion and pulled back in like a harbor seal. And one more time, stretched out like a sea lion and pulled back in like a harbor seal. Let's see what else we can stretch like. Ah, now I love this one because at first you might look at it and be like, how am I going to move like this animal, right? Our little puffer fish here, this is a porcupine fish. They swim with their pectoral fin, which is like their tail fin. So we could kind of go like this and move around a little bit. But what I want to highlight about this animal here is this really amazing adaptation that they have um, that involves puffing up their body, right? Now, um, they use it as a line of defense, okay? So remember, adaptations, something that an animal has or is born with or does that helps um, them survive. So finding a mate finding food, or defense, 
keeping from becoming food, right? And so when a porcupine fish like this decides to use that defense mechanism, what they're going to do is they're going to actually expand their body. Now, you and I are not covered in spikes, okay? Unless maybe some of you have some hair gel in, you might have some spiky hair. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to think like a puffer fish, and we are going to try to expand our body and just take up as much space as possible, okay? And in order to do that, remember, we have lungs inside of our chest that we can really expand and take a deep breath and really just open up from within, okay? I know it sounds funny, but I want you to think about that as if you were a puffer fish. So on the count of three, we're going to open up like a puffer fish. Maybe we can start kind of enclosed and then you'll really feel a difference. So one, two, three, big breath and take up as much space as you can <sighs> and let it back out. So then we kind of think of the puffer fish as deflating, right? But what they're really doing is going back to their natural state, which is like this. Now, when puffers expend that energy, it can actually use a lot of energy and um, it's not always the best option for them. So if you're out there snorkeling or you have a pet puffer fish or anything like that, you want to make sure that you're not causing it to stretch like that because um, like I said, it's their defense mechanism and we don't want to overwork them. But for you and I, it just feels good to open up. Let's do that one more time. Ready? Close. Exhale all your breath. Ready? And uh, um, inhale. Ready? Oh, as big as we can. And out again. One more time. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Man, I don't know about you, but I feel much better than I did 15 minutes ago. All right, so our puffers have that really amazing puffing adaptation. Oh, we've got a cute video of them swimming. So remember, I mentioned that caudal fin. Let's see what we've got. <laughs> so they use actually these back fins. Um, that's the anal and the dorsal fin. And then they also use their little pectorals. They kind of use all their fins to really move around. Um, oftentimes they'll swim like this. But then they have their little back fin going while they're at it. So um, for as energy releasing as that was for us, it can actually cost a lot for them. Um, so that was a great video. Thank you, Sarah. Now we're going to move on to our next stretching animal here, okay, or to talk about a different adaptation. Now, friends, don't forget we do have that phone number for you to join us today. It is 562 286 1838. So it's going to be on the screen right over here, 562 286 1838. If we're moving and grooving, or I guess I should say if we're breathing and stretching, like any of our animals that we have on the screen today, and you want to know something more, you're curious about that animal, you are wondering something about how, how that adaptation works or anything like that, please, please, please feel free to text in. We love to hear from you all. All right, so what's on the screen now? What is that thing? Hmm. Well, that one's different. It kind of reminds me of the same movement as kelp, right? But animals are doing right here is these are anemones and anemones they're moving um especially in this photo because there's actually a current coming from this upper part okay anemones just sit there and go like this <laughs> um, it usually has to do with the current but what i like to think about anemones is they have this great adaptation that allows them to open up and then close up and then open up and close up and what they're doing when an anemone does that is they're opening up with these tentacles, okay? And they're expanding and they use those tentacles to catch prey. Remember, that's an adaptation. And then they can close up for a handful of reasons. One of them is to take that food and put it in towards their stomach, which is usually right in the center here. Oh, perfect, right there. And then they can digest that food inside, okay? So um, it's a little bit different than you and I. They catch their food on the outside right here and then it goes into the stomach, it goes into the body cavity, they digest it, and then it goes bloop, straight back out, okay? Um, and so the other reason that they might close up is defense, right? So they might be like mm, tucking in, closing in, kind of hiding, making sure my soft body right here is protected um, and closed up. They can also do that to make sure that they're not drying out. Now, that's a little confusing because they live in the ocean, right? And yet, Anemones like this are what we call a tide pool or intertidal animal, and they can be found on land, or at least what we think of as land. So the tide is the movement of water around our globe. It can cause swells in certain areas, okay? So it's 
Uh, you can have a high tide, which might cover more rocks and more beach. And then you can have a low tide, which exposes some rocky areas and more beach. And anemones like this kind of live in the zone that's right in the middle. And so at a very, very low tide, anemones who are used to living underwater might actually be out on a rock on a hot, sunny day. So they'll take their body and they'll really close it up. And they'll actually even attach sand and little particles of shells around their body, kind of acting, I like to think of it as a sunscreen, right? <laughs> it's protecting their body, making sure that they don't dry out. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be like an anemone. And when I say that, I mean, we're going to open up and we're going to do this. We're going to bring our arms across, open up, and then we're going to close up all the way down. Ready? Close up. And one more time, we're going to take a deep breath. Ready? Open up. Oh. All right, everyone. And one more time, we're going to close. Ready? Ooh. Close up like an anemone. All right. And one last time, we're going to open up and drop your hands down at the side, just like that. So when you see an anemone, whether they're open or closed, I want you to think about those adaptations that we just chatted about, okay? Maybe we're discovering a little bit more about animals while we move and think about what they're doing, right? So great job. All right, we're going to pop up another animal here, see what we're going to do. Oh, I like this one. This is going to be a little bit of a challenge just looking at it, right? So what is this? Yeah, exactly. That's a snail. Now, sea snails, um, sometimes we forget that snails, well, actually, this is kind of funny. So I think those of us who are like on land all the time, maybe if we have a garden, right? We're so used to animal, or I'm sorry, like garden snails that we forget snails live in the sea. Whereas for me, um, I'm so used to talking about sea snails that sometimes I forget snails live in gardens, right? So sometimes it's just what you're used to, whatever you're um, more accustomed to hearing about. But sea snails do, in fact, live in the sea. Now, we're going to do this. We're getting a couple questions in through the chat line, which, like I said, we love. Keep them coming. Um, we're going to do our movement to remind us about some of these adaptations. And then we'll take a break and we'll answer some of those questions that you friends might have. So what do we know about snails? What adaptations, something that they have that, they, uh, that helps them survive, do snails have? They can be snails in the ocean and snails on land. Okay. Hmm. Oh, of course. They have a hard protective cover, right? Now, our hard skull is our hard protective cover for our soft brain. But we have skin and hair and, and, and you know, body stuff over it. And so uh, they have this nice hard shell that's on the outside and their soft body is inside. And what they do is snails actually have what I think of as a little trap door. It's called an operculum, okay? Which you might have actually heard us say operculum on our online academy before, but we usually refer to it talking about the hard covering of a fish gill. Sarah, do we have an operculum photo? I know I kind of threw that one at her unexpectedly. So, uh, perfect. So this plate right here, I know to us it just looks like a cheek, right? Um, but this line, this is actually the opening of a gill cover. So if you can take your hands like this and open and close. Some fish actually will breathe like that. So you might have seen that happening. Um, so this is usually what we refer to as an operculum on our online academy. But snails also have an operculum. It's a different body part. But what it is, this soft body can actually tuck all the way up inside of that hard shell, protective shell, right? And then this operculum, it's another little hard plate, goes whoop, and it actually kind of closes in the shell so that from all sides, a soft-bodied snail is protected from a hard covering. So like I said, I think of it like a trap door. Now, we don't have any trap doors that we're going to be able to use, okay? But what we're going to do is we're going to be a soft-bodied snail. So everybody kind of stretch out, wiggle around a little bit. Yeah, you got your soft body, okay? And then we're going to take a deep breath, and we're going to tuck into our shell like this. We're going to go... I take that back. We're going to exhale, okay? Ready? We're going to tuck in. And then now we're going to take a deep breath, and we're going to exhale or inhale as we come out of our shell. Does everybody feel like they're blossoming? They're coming out of their shell? Ooh, here's another kind of snail-like uh, creature. This is a chestnut cowrie. It's got this soft body here. 
only their shell is a little bit different. This is their hard shell, right? Um, and their shell is beautiful and shiny because this soft body actually comes out and polishes the shell, right? Kind of like how we brush our teeth daily. We try to clean them and polish them, right? But they do the same thing. They'll tuck up, ready? And then we're going to open up again, ready? Stretch out. Ooh, and snails like to look around a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, this little part, is it on that side? No, right here. Orange on the bottom. Aha. Thank you. So this little part right here is actually the snail's eyeball. And they come out. So maybe this time we can add little eyeballs. Ready? We're going to close up. And we're going to inhale. Ready? Little eyeballs. And stretch. Open up your chest. And one more time we're going to tuck into our shell. Oh, there's a predator. Ah! And up. Ready? Oh, much better. All right. So our snails, right? We don't really think of them as moving around a whole lot. But when we think about our stretching movement, we might remember that they have that hard shell as a great adaptation to protect their soft body. Now we're going to jump back to the studio and we're going to answer some questions. So it uh, looks like Perry wants to know, how can you tell the difference between octopus species? That's a great question. So we're going to actually put two on the screen. Okay, we have two. Um, we have this one, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Recognize the spot right here. This is a two-spot octopus. Now, you might be looking at me like, Dana, there's only one. But on the other side of this animal's body, there's going to be a second false eye spot. Okay, so think of it like maybe on their neck, kind of one here, one here. So um, two-spot octopus are kind of known for this really mottled coloration. Now, octopus can change colors all the time right? They have an amazing adaptation for camouflage. But for the most part, for a two-spot octopus, you're always going to be looking for this little spot on their side right there. Um, whether they're a dark red body um, and a dark brown spot, or maybe a more colorful kind of white patchy blotchy body with a more blue spot. Um, it just depends on what coloration pattern they have displayed at the time. Um, a giant Pacific octopus, uh, this actually I think is a little red octopus. So this um, little red octopus kind of get their name because they're mostly red, <laughs> right? Now remember, they can change color, but it kind of is named based off of their, their average coloration pattern. Um, it also depends how many suctions they have. The size, right? Two spot can only really be about this big, while giant Pacific octopus can be bigger than me, okay? Um, so this is our giant Pacific octopus. You'll see that they're usually known for this really deep, beautiful red coloration. Um, they can also flash white as they get, um, if they're stressed or even uncomfortable, or even if they're just aging, they can kind of fade to a more white coloration. Um, and so color, size, behavior, and geographical range can really tell you a lot about what species of octopus you're working with. Now, Chanel wants to know, how do seals grab food with small hands? That's a great question. That is a wonderful question. How are we going to do this? Well, actually, I'm going to cover it up again. So they have their little hands right here. But what else do seals have? That's right. Seals have a mouth. Now, a lot of sea animals don't actually grab food right? Usually seals, like this is Shelby here. She's one of our harbor seals at the aquarium. See that mottled coloration we talked about? Cookies and cream ice cream. Um, they are going to swim after prey. So their, their little flippers actually in. They don't really use them. And they swim around after their prey, mouths wide open, and they're just going to take it down. Now, I do have a very funny story, okay? Um, remember, animals eat animals, okay? And I was on a scuba dive one time, and it was a night dive, and I had a flashlight because it's dark in the ocean, right? And so it was dark outside. It was dark in the ocean. I had my flashlight. I was swimming around. And all of a sudden, I was counting my buddies. And I went, buddy number one, buddy number two, buddy number... Ah! And there was a harbor seal just following us this whole dive. And I was like, well, that's not my scuba buddy. But for this dive, I think we're going to be best friends, right? And so this seal actually followed us. And I was trying to think, well, why are you doing that? And then I realized it's because while seals are adapted to hunt in the dark ocean and they're adapted to live and, and use other senses to find food, 
gets a lot easier when somebody's swimming around with a flashlight, right? So this seal was actually using not its flippers, but it was using its eyes and its mouth to swim after and catch fish inside our lights, which was really amazing to watch. Now, um, so now we can kind of think, think about sharks, right? The same way. They don't have thumbs. They're not, they're not like taking a knife and a fork and cutting up their nice dinner for their, you know, family. They are going after their prey and they're using their teeth to do the same thing. So usually animals will have a different adaptation. Um, let's see. Is that, um, is that Ayla? Cynthia? Okay, so Ayla, I believe, sorry if that's not correct, um, wants to know why do seals have nails? Ah, good question. So seals, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this well. So seals have nails. You'll see them scratching themselves a lot. All right, so even though they have these tiny little flippers, they still can scratch. Um, so it might be to groom themselves, maybe to scratch off parasites. Can you think of any other reasons, studio, of why they might have nails? Oh, defense. Duh. <laughs> so um, I know it might be weird for us to think, right? But um, they might use those nails for defense. In fact, as soon as you said that, um, sea lions, for example, well, they also have nails. They'll use those to scratch at eyes, right? So they're going to be hitting and scratching at the at predators, which is one reason that some sharks have something called a nictitating um, membrane. It's not an eyelid, but it is something that covers their eye right as they're about to attack a seal because what they're doing is they're protecting that really vulnerable part from sea lion teeth or nails or, you know, kicks, anything. Um, so yeah, it's usually a defense. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> All right, my friends. So we are wrapping up here in the studio, but we're going to do one more flow through of all of those movements. Okay. Get ready. Get your pants ready. All right. We're going to start with our kelp. We're going to sway a little bit. Make sure your shoulders aren't rising up. You're going to go right here. You're going to sway like kelp. And then we're going to reach like an octopus. We can just keep this on the screen. We're going to reach. We're going to grab a clam. We're going to grab a crab. All right. Then what did we do? We're going to stretch out like a sea lion. Remember, they have long arms. And then we're going to tuck back in like a seal. Little tiny ones. And then we're going to stretch out like a sea lion. And tuck in like a seal. All right, what else did we do? We did a puffer, right? That was when we kind of closed our body. And we expand as big as we can. Ready? We're going to go close. And a big breath. Just like a puffer. Good job. And then we also talked about anemones and how we can open all the way. That feels good. And close. Ready? And open one more time. Oh, there we go. Stretch, stretch, stretch. Maybe reach with your tentacles. And close. And then we also talked about snails. Right? So we kind of closed up into our shell and then we reached out with our little eyes and we went really extend that neck. Ooh, what do we got out here? And then we tucked back into our shell and we really extended our neck. Ooh, what's out here? Looking around. All right. And I think that's what we wrapped it up. We were following up some questions of yours. So thank you for joining us for this moving and grooving. Like I said, it was a little bit different, but I hope you feel nice and calm and relaxed. Um, you can always watch it again if you feel like you've got a little bit of pent up energy. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you again at two o'clock today. We're doing a squid dissection. All right. Now, what that means is we're going to be taking a squid that was harvested for seafood and we're going to be cutting it open and exploring all of the internal anatomy and some of the external and learning a little bit more about what is inside a squid. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, we'll see you back here at two o'clock. Otherwise, have a wonderful Tuesday afternoon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>